uh, as the use of functionality, it may uh, uh, allow uh, to obtain more changes than later on. Because once a country becomes a member state, then the external supervision uh, and the pressure shrinks um, due precisely to the limited competency of the European Union in the field of media freedom. And I've just described This is the fundamental reason to work on consolidating media freedom reform and to do it together. Um, furthermore, uh, as we heard from the President of the European Commission, the current rule of law, rule of law mechanism uh, for the review of uh, the, the democratic standard for member states that include the uh, uh, of media freedom protection will be extended to candidate countries in the next few years. Therefore, we have an opportunity uh, to work uh, specifically on exchange of experiences on similar ground um, that are crucial for our current, uh, current and future. European member um, states. Finally, um, today we discuss a number of important endeavors um, in the EU media policy, but also their potential and their shortcomings. And we need to reflect uh, on where we go from now, from here. What is the goal of our advocacy action in the future? What we learned um, up to now and what we should consider central for that in the near future. With the upcoming European elections that um, might create a much less favorable context uh, for the deepening of European integration and specifically uh, in the field of protection of the European. Therefore, let me wish you a fruitful exchange um, and a strengthen collaboration in the near future. And I'm um, happy to now give the floor to Ambassador Daniel, President of our Scientific Board, um, but most importantly, former OSC Secretary General, uh, and with its very own um, curriculum, that, uh, curriculum that I'm not going to describe to you, but um, the floor is enough. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, and good morning, everybody. When uh, Louisa came back with me, uh, she was in the process of uh, which are failed of the organization which then which got me the available to I accepted with enthusiasm, uh, mainly because I've had a very worried at the uh, open sea. <clears throat> so I, I'm happy to uh, uh, present to you some some very general considerations before we discuss the details of the uh, but uh, looking at the bigger picture, the bigger picture uh, is uh, uh, unfortunately a very thin uh, uh, side of, uh, of things in our uh, On the one hand, we have seen a resurgence uh, of the politics, uh, the political confrontation in Europe and beyond Europe, uh, and, uh, and this uh, it's confrontation keeps deepening. Uh, uh, on the other hand, we face some understanding. Uh, which uh, uh, are getting people of our societies uh, worried, and uh, as a result, and not only as a result of the combination of these factors, what we see is uh, uh, increasing populism, increasing nationalism uh, at the political level. Uh, at the end of the day, we see an erosion. Of the democratic values uh, that uh, uh, have been a way governed our world as we know it uh, uh, last uh, yeah, forever. That's the thing that we do. The erosion of, uh, of one of the democratic values, I can't help thinking I can I have a strong voice in the crowd, of course. And there was a new document at the end of the end of the fall of the Charter of Paris for a new Europe, which was in fact mm -hmm. very, this was really by all of the states from uh, the United States and Canada to uh, the Russian Federation and some Asian countries. And uh, uh, promoting uh, democratic values was very much at the same of this as a tool to promote peace and to promote uh, civilization. But of course, what we saw after that was not necessarily in line with that, with that vision, and, uh, and we saw the constant decline uh, of, uh, of, those, uh, of those values and the commitments to, uh, to, uh, to uphold them. 
and with the backsliding of, uh, uh, of uh, democratic values, we see also a backsliding of everything that is attached to that, the protection of human rights, uh, the rule of law. Uh, and of course, fundamental human rights and fundamental freedoms can be the key element of this, freedom of expression, freedom of belief. So, the trend goes on, unfortunately, in the direction of the police. So it is important to start talking. And uh, you know, I uh, talk about imprisonment and killing because those are the most critical things, but the uh, sets of uh, uh, problems that uh, uh, journalists encounter today is much uh, is much broader. Uh, legal harassment, if you were accepted on this Latin, you know, the way that uh, uh, what was uh, uh, saying, uh, uh, the digital threats. Against individual uh, journalists, but also the use of uh, uh, digital platforms, social media, by, by uh, governments, uh, uh, by also, uh, how can I say, economic centers, in a way, serving their own interests um, and very often putting pressure on media uh, to do that. Um, surveillance. Uh, we have to see quite a few instances of, of that increasing and putting pressure on social themselves. So these are all factors, and there may be you know, quite a few others, uh, that in fact do uh, affect uh, pluralism in our society and the ability of the uh, uh, media to express the view can be critical, uh, but critical views are key. Uh, also, to the system to, uh, you know, thinking out all aspects of issues and uh, the only thing that we have to study today to make sure that governments take into account the legal issues uh, in and when they make their decisions. But this is unfortunately not what we see happening uh, 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 if we look around. Um, in, uh, well, first of all, I want to share with you a little episode that I, I saw uh, close by. Uh, when I was reading a series that involved a lot with uh, the Ukraine, from you know, from the former crisis, Ukraine made a change to the U.S. because in the end of the year, they were able to change. So I was working with uh, young folks uh, in the poor time to open up the European perspective of Ukraine. It's only that, but he was going to the next few days. And then, 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 but one of the things I saw uh, when the separate was out of Korea, when we started seeing the separate music forces in the uh, and we saw the parallel of the city where the media started. But the other thing they did, they took control of the police stations and they put the White House down the steps. There were other White House standing in many The second thing they did, they took control of all the speakers of the uh, radio television. So that the Ukrainian uh, media outlets would not reach, not be able to reach uh, those Eastern Ukrainian provinces anymore. They were all the Russian, the Russian, the Russian, the Russian uh, media media information. So this was a key tool to influence the people on the ground to pass on the narrative to the other side of the conflict. One of the things I was doing in that period, I was watching like Russia today and the Western media uh, to, to, to try to understand also where the society is coming from in terms of the developing conflict in the region. And I felt like there were two completely different stories. There were two totally different interpretations of what was going was on. Really but why on the West if there were different shades of gray, excuse me, gray? Uh, the, the Eastern the Russian version was very beautiful. Every media outlet was there were one or two exceptions 
which over time is clear uh, from, from the scene, and everybody was, was in a way uh, passing a very uh, uniform uh, message, a common message. So I was wondering if these journalists, uh, they have little choice. Uh, they really have some of them being convinced of what they say, but if they're not convinced, they still have to say the same thing. They have to say the same story, they have to keep it up. The same episode, because of course, also selection of what you want to represent, the a person rather than another, and then you can turn the wrong version of the story. So that was a very uh, vivid example of uh, uh, how, in a place where media freedom is, is constrained, uh, journalists have become a useful man uh, for furthering the political interests and, and, and uh, for furthering you know, narratives that are in the long term <coughs> very, very damaging because they, they won't be uh, useful in terms of uh, helping us find ways to overcome uh, the crisis. So, so tools for conflict, in a way. Uh, and that, that is a very good illustration of the point. And the situation remains straight. Uh, you, you, you see, there is a, a, a media line in the long to the light, and it's difficult to find a problem with space for what they do. And these things for as long as this continues. The fact that I want to tell you a few stories in the PDOSC, we have uh, uh, an institution which is an independent institution called the uh, uh, Representative of the Freedom of the uh, I remember when I joined the second general, the first president of the Media uh, was a powerful uh, Muslim lady, Dunia Miyato, who then became Commission of Human Rights of the Europe, and we were good friends with her. And uh, one of the things I noticed, uh, it's not the most popular institution, of course, in the US, because it's not in countries and governments, uh, or you should be considered very representative. She was a nice lady coming from the border of the North. One day she told me that she didn't even have a diplomatic passport. And I said, Well, you know, I mean, that is all. You have to travel a lot. You need to, you know, I mean, I suppose these are still the guy, you know, you do that away. So let me go to a foreign minister. And I, I spoke to a foreign minister, and uh, we had quite a long conversation, but in the end, we accepted and gave her the passport. But I was thinking, Well, you. Really? If they really need to do that, you have to And the idea that, first of all, Bodilas Bodina was not even interested in having one of the national screens drawn. And secondly, they even perhaps were thinking that this was the thing to make because she was criticizing some of the, uh, some of the policies of the country. Uh, so they needed the really to do sort of mix the arms of the military and the other the government. And he said then, after that, they did recognize. But he was interested also to see that when she finished the second term, uh, the mandate of three years in Europe or all the ones, the countries of the US, three years in the center of the center, they don't have any only new name. So they renewed her a couple of times for two months, and then the position remained vacant until a deal was made on all the key jobs and then the state, who came, however, under huge pressure immediately from things to say, was trying to say acting. And, uh, and at the end of his mandate, after three years, he was the first victim, and his mandate was not renewed. And then this created the collapse of all the, the, the key positions in the OSC. So there were six months of the OSC government as an institution. And then they appointed a new one, that's a very good uh, Portuguese lady, who is in now, now in Poland, but the things I'm hearing again is that she will not be new because she's speaking up, she's defending the journalism, she's defending freedom of expression, and this is offensive for governments, which is outrageous to be very uh, uh, But that's, that's the way it is. This is a world we uh, really do, unfortunately. And, uh, and it's uh, and that's what we, uh, we 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 have to take care to to, to take uh, account of and, uh, and to work. Uh, so it is good that we have events like this. The last point I wanted to make very briefly is that I just uh, looking at uh, uh, some of the uh, reports from the current uh, representative of the media. I see she issued a joint declaration 
together uh, with a, a special observatory on the expression of the United Nations and then uh, the uh, uh, organization of the United States and the African Union. So the UN and three of the two regional organizations together. Um, uh, declaration of World Peace and World Press Freedom Day. And this joint declaration, I quote, it takes to promote the understanding of the role of the media as an essential underpinning of democracy, human rights, and sustainable development. By providing reliable information, explanation, analysis, the media enables a public debate and an informed and active citizenry. This facilitates clearly the value of direction. Key issue because we see the role of the media in the elections of the US election monitor, and we see the value of the media play a key role in the burden of the um, And other forms of public participation, community engagement, including decision making processes, and not limited to pieces. So, this is the topic of the event today. And I, I think it's good that we see that you have also. The key representative of the international community very much in line with the objectives. Uh, uh, so I wish you all the best for uh, your discussions this uh, day and look forward to doing it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks to John Bedford Daniel and the ambassador for its encouraging introduction. Um, it's time to start uh, uh, the debate around the three panels. So I'm very glad to leave the floor. To my colleague Ulrike Kellner for the first panel, the vote group towards a European society equipped to respond to slaps, counter and vexation, vexatious lawsuits through awareness raising and training activities. I also to the floor, Ulrike um, Kellner, a research and advocacy officer at the University of Trans Europa. Um, Roberta Tauri is moderator of the Media Freedom um, Program Officer uh, Capital 19 Europe. And our speakers, um, Sara Manvera, media journalist, Vesna Alaburic, lawyer and media business expert, um, Elena Vasic, project manager at CRIC, and Emina Veljovic, director of the Paris Center in Zion. The floor is one. Good morning, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for being here and taking the time to attend our panel. Um, my name is Sipi Kanna, and I'm a researcher and a public officer in the Central Europa and Caucasus of Trans Europa. And here I work within the media freedom work response. Uh, and so it is my pleasure to introduce you today to our discussion uh, dedicated to this phenomenon. Um, over the past year, the EU institutions have been reaching and discussing a number of measures um, aimed at strengthening press freedom across, across the EU. Um, these measures do respond to the 2020 European Democracy Action Plan. And one of these documents is, um, is aimed at equipping the judiciary uh, with means to counter taxation lawsuits. And, and the objective of our panel today is to highlight the phenomenal slots at the European level and then zoom in and two case studies that are relevant for us, Croatia, Italy, Serbia, and Bosnia and Herzegovina. 
When choosing our speakers, uh, we wanted to cover both those regions that are relevant for electricity, but also for the immediate bibliographic response, but also bringing, bringing in a range of expertise and points of view to cover both the targets of slots and also work towards countering them. It is not convenient to say that uh, the final goal is to demonstrate that slots are indeed a transnational phenomenon and that we, public, public watchdogs, each of us in our different capacities as journalists and activists and researchers. We should work together towards countering them, both within the EU and independent countries. And it is important that we ask ourselves how we do that. The notion of slots was conceptualized in the late 1980s in the States. However, the, the phenomenon remained mostly unknown at the European level until a very few years ago. Partly because it was left widespread, but also partly because of lack of awareness. The existence of this love phenomenon emerged dramatically exactly six years ago, in 2017, when the non DC Western journalist, Daphne Cardona Galicia, was killed in a bomb attack. This story is very well known to most of you, but I would like to mention a few details of Daphne's work, focused on of Daphne's work, which was focus on the activities of neo-Nazi groups, armed traffic dealing, politicians and judges. Before the bomb blew up her car, she had suffered a number of aggressions. She was to attempt to set on fire her house and inspect the key of her dog's car. So a trail of warnings against her writing, accompanied by a flood of, let's say she's lawsuits. Recalling this circumstance, it is not only important because yes, yesterday we commemorated six years with her death. Spelling out the context in which she was started by almost 50 slaps helps us to understand what slaps really are, which is to say a form of legal harassment against critical voices pursued by powerful individuals who seek to avoid public scrutiny and to transfer the debate from the public sphere to the judiciary one, we will be ultimately the debate about questions of public interest. It is thanks to the activism of the Daphne Corona and the Foundation family that we witnessed the mobilization of the civil society, first at the Marcus level and then at the European level. So in 2018, we had the European Parliament calling on the Commission to, to, to propose an, an initiative on the counter staff. So in April 2022, we had a presentation of a package of measures. It was directed, which is currently being discussed within the trials, and a set of recommendations. As we can hear from our speakers today, EU member states are proposing a significant resistance to a strong anti staff directive. But we expect the adoption of a concerted document sometimes in 2024. But why is it important to examine case studies, which are both EU member states and country countries? Not only because they are falling under the mandate of MFR and OPCP. For one, the dynamics of SLAPS in, uh, in Serbia, Italy, Croatia, and Bosnia Herzegovina present a number of similarities. In each of these countries, we experience manifestly unfounded or exaggerated lawsuits in which the actors are high profile public figures. And in each of them, investigative journalists dedicated to shedding light to the connection between politics and criminal organizations is frequently responded to its results. Moreover, the recent decision of the European Commission to include candidate countries into its yearly rule of law reports will draw the attention on their performances when dealing with slots. In fact, the degree of freedom according to, according to political debate and criticism really represents the very essence of democratic societies. The role of journalists as public watchdogs plays at the very heart of the participation of the society in public affairs. And the legal cases which will be examined today are a reminder that freedom of expression is a right that cannot be taken for granted and is central not only for being practitioners but to the society as a whole. In closing, let me recall the title of our conference and ask you, what does it mean for the rule of law to have high profile figures respond to criticism with legal intimidation such as Italy and Serbia? 
What does it mean for the rule of law experiencing a legislation setback as the one represented by the recriminalization of the defamation in the service staff? And what does it mean for the rule of law when judges themselves resort to slaps to silence political authorities? And I will pass it on to Roberta Taveri. She, she is my very dear colleague from the MFRR. She is a senior advocacy officer at, at Article 19 in Europe. And uh, we work together, both within the MFRR, but also within the case in Telico Working Group. And I will leave the floor to her and our students. Thank you. Um, thank you, Silvia. Um, who is here? <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, we will try to reflect some of the questions that you raised at the end of your intervention. We have our speakers today, um, and we try to reinforce the European response to uh, the phenomenon of and um, let me uh, try to introduce my organization uh, first. Um, I work for Article 19 Europe. It's, a, it's an international organization uh, that uh, promotes and protects the right freedom of expression and access to information. Uh, in particular, we work on Europe and Central Asia. And uh, we are part together with the Secretary of the Balkanic Markets France Europa and other organizations present today. Uh, we are part of the Media Democratic Response Project uh, since already a few years now. Um, as Article 19 Europe, we started to work on SLAPS. Um, it's part also of a wider network of civil society organizations since uh, 2017, as if anyone reads at the time of uh, the assassination of the Nazis, the Nazis, and the Nazis. It actually exacts exactly six years ago, on the 16th of October 2017. Uh, when it was uh, it was clear that the practice uh, of abusing court proceedings and bringing sexual lawsuits uh, was used, this practice was used as a form to silence previous legal and public uh, participation. Uh, indeed, actually, Dr. Carmona Lisa was taking over 40 lawsuits at the time uh, of this information. Um, despite numerous efforts of civil society to counter this phenomenon, uh, as I mentioned, the media feedback response is one uh, for additional works on, uh, on this, uh, uh, together also with the coalition against Sams in Europe. Actually, this practice is still what we use with the peers and the last months today um, from the organized uh, activists uh, from, from the four countries that are able to thank Serbia, Bosnia, Herzegovina, Italy, and Croatia. But it's actually much, much wider than um, these four countries and uh, Virtually, uh, and classes of the countries in Europe. Um, the key elements of, of SLAPS, just a uh, way of introduction, are usually recognizing the unbalance of power between the claimant and the defendants, the claimant being uh, power to the individuals in society, to the position, to the position, to the implement. Um, Whereas on the other side, the defendants are uh, usually uh, most of the time actually as uh, documented by the tradition against us in Europe, journalists, either freelancers or uh, media outlets, they can be the media outlets themselves, or activists. Um, so they could be animalized activists or environmental activists. Um, there is a second element important to recognize that it's very really the element of public participation. So the story must have um public participation uh, factor in the case. And then the method of abusing the law and usually um the request of really it's um proportion made uh, high damages and then the uh, the practice the practice of really moving to lawsuits against uh, the same uh, defendants. By the same player, and we have given here uh, a few testimonies of that as well today. Um, in terms of numbers, uh, case uh, published the Commission that we have stopped in their published um, reports every year trying to provide a kind of uh, statistics around the numbers of uh, sub cases uh, that um, are documented in Europe. And in the period of 2010 to 2022, um, it documented around 800 cases of slap across uh, Europe. Uh, it has to be mentioned that it, actually this data may be incomplete because it really relies on the information and the monitoring that is conducted at national level. 
So it could be underestimated what did the, the numbers are much higher than um, what what uh, what we need. Um, so we'll try to, I think it was saying, we'll try to, to focus the discussion today on SAPs across the region, so between uh, the countries of the Western Balkans and Italy, um, and try to connect the dots uh, between these countries and the story we will hear, uh, especially also connecting to the, the topic of, of the conference today, which is what is uh, then the impact of SAPs on the rule of law and democracy in Italy. Um, I will then uh, start immediately by introducing uh, the speakers. Uh, so we are um, at the other the table, Emina Belevich, she's the executive director of the association Arts Center Sarajevo. Um, and as an environmental lawyer, she contributed to the protection of the environment in Bosnia and Herzegovina and participated in the amendments of more intimate laws and uh, uh, good books in the field of environmental law. Uh, as part of her work in the Arts Center, uh, she worked on the drafting uh, of a law on citizens initiative and protection of citizens and activists of the Federation of the Herzegovina. The book includes after last week's edition, so the was about the initiative uh, content. Um, she, she also worked on analysis of the impact of staffs on environmental activists, most in Herzegovina, and uh, the aim of providing illegal assistance. Yeah. Um, then we have another lawyer in the panel, Bezna Araguric, um, from, uh, from Croatia. She has vast experience in criminal and civil matters and international human rights law. She's a member of the expert group against lapses of the European Commission, uh, which aims to advise the Commission on any matter relating to the fight against lapses, uh, all the support to the candidates. Uh, she previously worked as a lecturer in the law at Atlanta uh, University and cooperated extensively with various international, uh, governmental, and non governmental organizations in various issues related to the respective legislation and, and both practice. Next to me, I have uh, Elena Vasic. Um, she's a journalist and is the project management work at the Serbian Investigative uh, Portal B, uh, which stands for Crime and Corruption Network. In Serbia. Um, he founded in 2015 with a group of uh, five journalists, and um, FIC is uh, dedicated exclusively to exposing corruption and organized crime at the highest level of power in Serbia. Uh, during the first eight years of, um, uh, of its existence, its work, FIC team has published more than 100 investigative stories. Around the links between corruption and public institutions in, in the country. And since 2021, uh, FIC 2 is facing uh, another energy slack case. We'll hear more from Yelena about this. Um, but they are managing to work successfully uh, despite all these challenges, slack, and other pressures they receive. And which, uh, the, the leadership has grown to a million leaders per month. Uh, finally, we also have with us uh, Sara Mancera. She's a freelance journalist from Italy. She's an author, independent, independent filmmaker. Um, she has worked extensively both in Italy but also abroad uh, in Iraq, Syria, other countries across the uh, Middle East and uh, Africa, covering environmental conflicts, gender issues, um, human rights, and food supply chains. Uh, an investigation that we published by Al Jazeera, Liberation, El País, The Guardian, Little Media, and other outlets. And she combines journalism and public participation to local events, debates, and festivals organized by FADA, uh, an association of journalists, photographers, and authors, for which uh, she is a uh, So let, let's um, go into the debate. Um, I will know better on the speakers. Um, and I would like to ask uh, actually all of you, all of them, uh, a general question on uh, what is the situation of slaps in, in each of your country? If you can give us, um, talk about your experiences, um, maybe slap cases you have faced either as a journalist or they have defended in the world from a lawyer. And um, I would maybe like to start with Elena um, uh, as. Um, Fik is currently facing over 12 lawsuits uh, for the work that uh, you conduct. And um, I want to ask you what does it mean to be a target of these lawsuits? Uh, what are the consequences to you and to the families? Mm -hmm. 
um, I don't know if it works in this class. Um, well, um, it's a very um, broad question. If I have an hour, I will have this one. Um, I mean, um, the thing is, uh, uh, we are facing uh, 12 slides right now, uh, and all of them are um, launched by uh, uh, former or current state officials. Uh, or uh, highly uh, uh, controversial business person uh, or companies. And uh, um, the thing that combines them is the, the fact that Creek was investigating them and their uh, business deals, uh, and also uh, um, their all types of current regime. Uh, so basically, uh, um, as you said very well, uh, slaps are uh, uh, a new thing. Uh, especially in Serbia, uh, since 2020, 2021, those are the years when we actually started using the term slap. Um, um, previously, we had lots of, of course, but those were, you know, from time to time, occasionally, and we would want each case because we is investigated um, the portal, which publishes the stories only based on documentation and evidence. Uh, and we think we have a support your invention. But uh, the situation has changed. Um, uh, slaps uh, are for sure the newest form of pressure. Um, the current regime in Serbia has been testing different forms of pressure throughout these years. Um, uh, smear campaigns, uh, harassment, death threats, uh, we name it. Uh, we had breaking and entering into our apartments. Uh, as well, but uh, slap are the newest form of pressure because they are cheap for them and expensive for us. They are sophisticated form of pressure because um, you're just saying, I'm suing this media outlet because I feel that my honor was, you know, uh, damaged in some form and that's it. I'm, I'm not doing anything, you know, controversial. Um, but uh, the thing is, system is uh, helping powerful individuals to crash their journalists uh, uh, with, with lawsuits because um, why am I saying this? Uh, in these uh, previous months, we started losing uh, the, the lawsuits at the first instance. And that never happened before when you have all the evidence on your side. Uh, and we, we lost uh, on the first instance uh, the lawsuit that was launched, uh, I will give like maybe two examples out of 12, because we checked all the boxes you mentioned. Those are all powerful individuals. The amount of money they're asking is ridiculous. Uh, they, they are, they're, uh, they're suing us multiple times for, for the same thing or different things. So we, we check all the being slapped box. Um, but the thing is, I'm um, using an example of a current uh, police minister, and at the time when he sued us, he was uh, head of secret service in Serbia. And what we did, we were reporting from a public trial, and on that public trial, a prosecutor has exposed evidence that two uh, members of the crime group were talking among each other, and they were secretly wired that. And uh, that conversation is displayed in the court. And those criminals are talking to each other and saying, our boss does not have to worry because he has Bratis uh, Lakashic on his calendar. Basically, he said that he's paying off the uh, head of secret service of Serbia. So that was displayed in the courtroom in Spain. Our reporter has brought it down, Paul Gashic, he refused to comment, we published it, then he sued it, and he won on the first instance. And the explanation was crazy, like basically uh, uh, that was the situation when we realized that it's, uh, it's not safe anymore to report from trials. It's, it, uh, it's a situation when we uh, launched an international awareness campaign that's currently in Serbia. If you quote 
court document, but if it's regarding uh, you know, a powerful individual, you're about to be silenced. Uh, so we launched a huge campaign. A lot of people in this room have helped us with uh, their own uh, public statements, uh, with raising uh, awareness of what is happening. And uh, on the appeal court, we won. Uh, basically, I, I call it a win uh, for now, because the appeal court has said that this verdict is, is uh, against the law and that it needs to go to retrial. Um, we have got, in the meantime, two more cases like this, um, uh, all of them uh, launched by very powerful individuals. One of them is um, accused of being uh, a leader of an organized crime group who sued us twice. Other lawsuit uh, being the, uh, launched by um, chiefs of a, a police unit. So we are fighting with, with um, serious individuals and uh, sometimes representatives of uh, institutions. And um, the problem we have is the court, you know, uh, because we would uh, uh, we would be able to fight any uh, 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 lawsuit in a fair court trial, but uh, we saw that, that that's not, not happening right now. Serbia doesn't have any kind of uh, anti-slap initiative in, in Serbia. Laws don't have a firm slap. Everything is just a lawsuit. Um, and um, that is why we're actually trying now to find uh, a mechanism to, to defend ourselves. And I can talk more about that later, but that, that is the general situation. Uh, we are not the only ones since 2020 and 2022. Other investigative and independent media outlets have been slapped. We have the most slaps, that's why we're uh, uh, known for now. Uh, but but uh, it, it became like a newest form of, of uh, pressure and it's being heavily used by my college. Thank you, uh, gentlemen, for talking to us about your experience and creating second the general situation. Um, I, I would like to look to another thing, the um, outside of, uh, of uh, the back of the region, but uh, similar issue like the Netherlands of Para. To explain uh, what in your case actually not facing and, and what it means, the same question, what it means for you and the public participation of the journalism. So, we're sure, thank you very much and good morning, everyone. My name is Sarah Mansur, I'm in today's journalist. Um, let me briefly explain to you what happened to me. So, um, on 1st September 2022, the local administration of the municipality of Abel de Grasso, which is a small town in the world, close to Milan, initiated a defamation lawsuit against me. Uh, I was accused of defamation in response to a speech, a public speech that I named uh, in Puto, uh, in the south of Italy, during uh, an award ceremony with uh, Nicola Gattieri, Judge. Uh, from one well known judge who work on the organized crime. I was there with Andrea Nicaso, who is also um, a historian and writer of the organized crime, and Isaiah Salis. And that day I was uh, receiving a prize with them in the south of Italy. And during uh, that ceremony, I was in front of uh, a group of students from different high school from the, that town. And I was explaining to them my work as a journalist, as a freelance journalist, I, how I started my career, what I did in Iraq, Syria, Lebanon. Um, and then I explained to them, uh, where are the mafia? What does the mafia do today? In the sense that uh, mafia is not uh, anymore just in the south of Italy, and uh, the presence of the organized crime is also in the north, yeah, in the legal economy, because they launder money uh, in the legal economy, especially uh, in malls, cement, buildings, restaurants, pubs, etc. And uh, while I was doing speech, I say that because you know, guys, even in my town, in the north of Italy, in the province of Milan, 
eyewitness mafia, probably in Tinga, uh, the, the administration, the construction vendors, um, and, and you know, mafia is particularly key in the home permitting of the construction sector. Um, the Council of Abitigrasso for this sentence uh, initiated a lawsuit against me. They didn't reach out to me, neither to ask for clarification, neither to discuss publicly my sentence, and they filed information lawsuit without prior notice. Uh, my sentence was taken out of the contest and distorted completely by the administration of the municipality. Um, as if I was accusing uh, the mayor of uh, uh, of market connection that I was not doing. Uh, the, sense, the sentence I was pronounced was a part of a broader speech where I was explaining to young students uh, where the organized crime, especially the Rangeta, um, enter inside the like, how they enter in the legal, in the legal economy. And um, and I was referring also to the historically non presence of the mafia um, of the Andrangheta specifically in the north of Italy, which is uh, quite known uh, since uh, thirty five years mainly. Um, so after three months of that uh, speech, the municipality initiated this. Um, Slap against uh, against me. Um, what does it mean? Uh, I mean, as a journalist, I do believe that public participation uh, means also participating in um, in public events, and I do believe that uh, public events are very important to um, raise awareness and to rebuild uh, trust between uh, journalists and uh, um, citizens, especially in this time. I do believe that also, uh, I mean, I, I'm going on the field, I do investigation, but I do believe that we need also to, to participate in public events and explain to people um, what, the, what, what is mafia, for example, today, how it changed. And uh, uh, talking, uh, publicly about the mafia uh, is very important because this is not just a, um, a judicial problem or a penal problem, you know, it's a social, cultural, and economic problem. And in order to face the mafia, um, also the culture, we need to do public events. Mm -hmm. And, um, for me, what uh, surprised me a lot was that uh, a mayor of the city, instead of calling me and saying, look, Sarah, do you have some new records? Why doesn't organize together a public event? Uh, or just, can you rectify what you said? Can you explain to me better what you said? He decided straightforward to, to, to the next room. And that's, I think, um, says a lot of the state of the situation that there is today in Italy. When you confront uh, power, when you denounce something, uh, when you criticize something, you are pleased in this moment, in this country. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah, for this uh, very Powerful testimony and good woman and good leaders. Also, that's what we need for the people of our country for democracy, for our for democracy. Um, I, I would like to give an opportunity also to even better to talk about uh, experiences of their work in uh, the countries in the Chantal. And to like to start uh, with Elena and then with Diana finally. Um, just Elena, if you uh, you work for an organization that um, protects um, the environment, you, you work with an environmental activist. Uh, can you tell us uh, a little bit about your work? What is the situation now um, in Bosnia and Herzegovina when it comes to plot against the environmental activists? Uh, as for many countries, there are no uh, up to date data, but uh, the magnitude is not against the uh, Activists and journalists in the country, but what is their intention at the result of the 
a great uh, advantages uh, to the firm because they have to pay you know, the, or the construction or the workers and they were losing money. Mm -hmm. That's the thinking in this institution. So this is how the laws started against the NGOs. Luckily, now we don't talk about the legal team. They also hired those uh, slot suits were uh, I mean, washed. But it was very like uh, the judge when he came to the law, to the uh, mm -hmm. court room, uh, law of the he said, please can you count by the NGO, please can you count this price submission. Because we believe this child will be switched by the rest of it. I said, if that will have to come and we can be talking on the IPA's office center or CNN, I could see from the space of judge. She was a little, you know, surprised why we came here and we are closing far to the legal representative of the, uh, uh, of the investor it was very touched with the like, how we can connect her who gave me the. Uh, you know, commission and I said, colleague, you know, I don't think the lawyer will have to have such a commission to make a court topic in this case. So they were very trusted with the because they understood, yes, why can you then what they will do in this case? And they could uh, do, I guess, the, uh, let's say, actively suspect you because we have the report from the police statement, they will not have to condemn the police minutes that even last. Or the basic evidence will be flawed. This is just one, uh, one example of how the law, the lawsuit is going to be second for one of the actual starting real fact, but I can say more later on. I just make sure it's more public at this point. And because of how many, many good and bad events come in memory during between the three countries we talked about now. Uh, I also you touched upon the importance of uh, giving visibility to the case and the importance of supporting the case and the uh, family. I would like to move to that now. It was uh, here uh, in discussing that a lawyer is a defendant uh, and journalist from uh, Slav lawsuits. Um, so I, we would like to hear more from your experience, especially in, in Croatia. So, what is the situation in Croatia and some of the cases that you find in what are the key elements that you see recurring uh, in, in the cases that you find? Okay, thank you. Hello to everybody. Uh, I'm the only person to say that uh, as far as the litigation exists, uh, the reason why the litigation exists uh, as well. So, misusing of litigation is something for the most careful for thousands of years. So, actually, nothing new. But the new is terminology, it's like this is one of the very effective things. And the new is that the pain to raise the awareness of the problem of slight lawsuits for democracy as a whole. Which is excellent, and that's why I really welcome the EU Commission and its campaign uh, to create anti slap politics and the legal framework uh, responsible. Uh, we in Croatia uh, were faced with uh, misusing of litigation as far as I work in this field, which is more than 40 years. Uh, just to mention that in the 90s, even a legal framework was created to prosecute independent journalists and to protect in a special way the, the, the reputation of the president of the state. Comparing to those years, which were only 30 years ago, and today's, I would say the situation is much, much better, but not good enough. Uh, we are in Croatia, uh, even today, faced with uh, thousands of lawsuits against uh, publishers, media outlets, and journalists. Uh, mostly it's a lot of information lawsuits, and uh, plaintiffs are uh, asking for millions of euros from the publishers. And even today, we have about 50, 60 criminal, across, uh, criminal cases against journalists for defamation and insults. I would say that he created and he tries to create a legal framework which is uh, pretty good comparing to legal framework in other European countries. I would say very uh, good. 
But we are faced at this moment with the challenges in the courtrooms, as the other one described, which is, I would say, uh, our the first and the biggest problem in my country, who actually uh, do not uh, have enough empathy to be an abstract right of freedom of expression, comparing to particular individuals. Uh, uh, rights for uh, to protect privacy, reputation, and other personality rights. And that's why we think that education of judges uh, and the education of lawyers who are defending journalists and representing the media to implement as much as possible to use rules of the open court of human rights is something which is essential at this moment. Uh, in Gilman's case, if those standards uh, were implemented, they would be a critical threat. They will be the case. Because reporting from the public report hearing is something which is protected in all democratic uh, countries. Uh, that's why I think that legal, uh, to create better legal framework is uh, very important, but to educate uh, the journalists. The, uh, from the ethical point of view, and uh, lawyers for defending journalists and uh, judges uh, is at this moment, I would say, crucial. And we are trying to do our best uh, uh, on that issue. Sure. In just one sentence, and we are trying to, you know, the, the, I think we managed to create a situation in Croatia that these journalists will get. A very good or the best possible in the land because publishers uh, uh, give uh, all legal support to their journalists and those who does not want such uh, legal help or, or uh, were not provided with such legal help can address the Generation uh, Journalist Association which creates uh, one center to defend uh, the freedom of expression and there are about 10 to 15 lawyers who are pro bono working for the Croatian Association. We have a list of lawyers uh, who are due to each day. So each journalist can uh, call at least one lawyer in the country to get and help needs. So that is something we are trying to do. Yeah, really important issue divide. I think we have time to talk more about it and see how it works in Croatia and where uh, it can be a good example of the whole country. Um, so now we, we heard about the situation in, in the whole country um, that we, we, we are discussing today. Um, and I would like to move the discussion into a similar topic, continuing to what we were discussing, connecting it also to the title of this conference. Uh, so the, the title that really very much looks at the role of um, um, democracy, the, the rule of law in a country. So I'm wondering how slabs can um, impact the rule of law in, in a country and, and can impact um, democracy. And I would like specifically to ask this question to Yelena and Tara, um, because you have raised your case with the fact that uh, you have been targeted by it. In both cases, um, there are politicians, members uh, of former members of the government who initiated for local uh, members of the local administration who initiated this um, this lawsuit uh, with uh, and the organization. So, in your opinion, what does that mean that a public official initiated that attack against them? What does that mean to the rule of law or how it relates to the office? Uh, well, uh, it's a, it's a tough act, you know, a big step act when, when we have um, many ministers and had several ministers in Greek uh, in, in, in previous years. When you have a minister, um, you know, denying to give an interview to media outlets, but instead he sued them, you know. Um, and basically, um, uh, now their easiest way to defend themselves because why they know the trials in Serbia last for years and when you sue someone the story about you um uh, uh 
will be forgotten in many years after the case is finished, you know, but that's our job to fight against those forgets. Um, but what you ask, basically, uh, um, this is now a popular mechanism, you know, uh, uh, slaps as, as, as such, because uh, the, the you know, people in power saw its uh, uh, effectiveness uh, on, on small media outlets. We had uh, some um, private, big private companies which are connected to states which are working uh, on many uh, state paid uh, 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 business deals um, who have sued uh, small uh, local media outlets in Serbia just for reporting about, uh, basically for republishing news about uh, their content. And uh, you could see basically that those media outlets have stopped reporting about that content. That will not happen to free. That is my point. We are investigating media outlets. We have international uh, 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 connections in, with uh, many international uh, media organizations and networks. Uh, we, we have the help of, of our colleagues abroad, we know the mechanisms we can use and we have used them so far. And uh, slaps are effective in a way that you know, if you're targeting an individual uh, who doesn't have a national uh, uh, attention, public attention or international connection, you are going to target them. They will you know, stop talking about you. And that is a huge step backwards if you're talking about the democracy, you're talking, you know, right to, 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 to say something, to, to participate um, in, in the public debate. Um, and um, also, I mean, um, I can talk later maybe more uh, on, on the ways how we decided to fight back. And we, we started using the mechanisms uh, 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 Raleigh Raleigh mentioned. We started calling into our trials uh, foreign observers. And we have got a confirmation from the UN office in Belgrade uh, that they will uh, be monitoring some of our trials because it has been uh, shown as a very significant that the judge knows that someone is watching what they're doing. Because otherwise, and I can tell you now that from multiple hearings we had with different judges, they are acting as um, prosecutors against us. Uh, they are dismissing evidence that we are giving to the court. They are uh, denying us the right to question uh, the person who is left us in the courtroom. Uh, they uh, are basically uh, showing that they're not objective, but we are reporting from every trial. That is now our, our uh, mechanism. We are basically um, giving, after each hearing, we write an article of what happened that day in court and who said what and how the judge behaved. We really feel it's necessary because if we're being silent, we're going to make it public, you know, to, to, to reverse the process. Um, and um, uh, the thing is, uh, and this lab initiative is not existing in Serbia. We are the ones facing the, the slap, so we are fighting them back, but we don't have like something that is uh, uh, um, uh, organized. Uh, we're heading towards it. Um, and um, I feel that what, what Vesna said is crucial by like educating uh, 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 judges educating the audience as well, uh, because no one will uh, do it instead of us who are currently facing the problem. And there are will be others uh, in three Yes. What's the perspective? You mentioned the importance as a journalist to also in the Participate in public events, so there was in various in various platforms. So, how do you think um, you know the North Korea is in the phenomenon? 
impacts on the level of value democracy in the uh, generally speaking, I believe that uh, flaps uh, are threats to the freedom of expression uh, because they can discourage the freedom of expression of uh, someone who can be a journalist, an intellectual, a writer, um, and also, of course, can have an impact on, on the investment of journalism, but more in general, the freedom of expression. Um, the threat of the legal action can lead to the form of self-censorship. We have to admit that because uh, more and more people cannot take a stand. Mm, if you are, in, especially if you are a philanthropist, and if you have to pay to your own costs, legal costs, why would you take a stand or take a position, a public position, um, if you risk to go fight for them. Uh, I think also that celebs, uh, um, of course, are an attack in general on media pluralism. Like, if uh, we think that celebs uh, um, can have a huge impact on independent media, especially those who are more independent from financial, economical, political power. And it has an impact uh, over the power and the need of authority as well. And the third part that I want to put uh, in the middle of the discussion is that uh, if a public official doesn't want to confront with the journalist, doesn't want, doesn't call a journalist when he's criticized, I believe that this is a uh, uh, the problem of democratic deficit. We have a problem of democracy because we, we are not even able to confront, I mean, in general, like public institutions to confront with the, uh, with the press and the contrary. So if a public official doesn't want to reply to a journalist, then we have a problem, a big problem. And this that is also connected, and I want you to, to put this at the attention, to the situation of the media in Italy in terms of conservation of power. If, uh, and this is for example, just my case, but if the mayor of this city uh, has never been confronted with a journalist, because we don't have local journalism anymore, which is an issue in Italy, because it's super, super difficult doing local journalism, independent and investigative. It's normal for them to, is to start the defamation against a journalist for the first time, ask <laughs> to go on to an issue that is a public interest, which is the threat of organized crime in the work of people. You know what I mean? Uh, and this, that's why I'm saying if a public official doesn't want to reply to journalists, it means that we have this problem in terms of. Uh, uh, media concentration of power. Like who has who has the power here in Istanbul? Who are the owners? How many independent journalists we have in Italy? This is an issue, and this connected, I believe, with the um, with the slabs. So we need to rethink on maybe supporting more. Independent uh, local newsroom, maybe. I mean, I'm just gonna put in the in the, in the in the public debate because I think that it's also important also to imagine solutions mm -hmm. and to think of on solutions. So if we have the problem slabs, what we need? Maybe we need more support to independent local small newsroom, probably. And I think and maybe we should. Uh, Talk about the strong media ownership concentration in this country. Probably. Well, thank you very much. I mean, um, the different um, voices that have been lost, journalists at such a local level, may think it twice before starting an investigation, obviously, on article. And the very important role that they play on the issue of uh, such a process, you know, 
I don't tell you that, that really. Um, but we talk more about this and perhaps a little bit more also some questions from, from the audience uh, to the director. Um, but let's let's maybe move um, to something else which is connected when you mentioned that uh, Yelena, uh, that there are a lot of people that are protecting the rest of Serbia and other, many other countries in Europe against us. And um, uh, there are also some examples, as uh, Felipe was mentioned in the introduction, uh, of um, laws that are actually uh, diverging, let's say, from uh, the standards of uh, international standards of freedom of expression. And one of them I wanted to ask again about it is the reintroduction of the criminal offense of defamation that could be the set stuff uh, in the in Bosnia Herzegovina. Um, I wanted to ask you a little bit about it, if you can explain uh, a little bit what happened uh, how, and also what that means for SLAT uh, in the public sector and even beyond in the population. But back in July, we took a sort of stop to go to the guys in the political world, with political opinions of our country. Uh, our countries uh, have two entities, one called Federation was a strong about the book a car, which is direct result of the Dayton and Peace Agreement. Uh, which established the peace after the war in our country. What does it mean? Although, of course, Macedonia is you know, an independent country, it consists of those two entities that have an essential um, power in, in their hands and they have like separate government. And that means also we have two basically legal systems in one country. So, in the legal system of Republika Srpska, uh, the criminal law is changed in that manner that now the Federation is once again criminalized. And at the same time, the Federation was Macedonia, there is no imposition of anti defamation, it's part of civil proceedings. If you feel that someone caused defamation against your good name or your job, you can start civil procedure and ask for the damages in front of the court in a monetary amount. The bottom mm -hmm. is very good for some stuff back in July. The legislature decided to criminalize defamation as well. And we can see this connected precisely to the right of the actors, especially the environmental sector and other sectors calling out on the uh, government in Republic of Srpska trying to point out to the corruption, and this was their answer. Another law is being prepared specifically targeted to the media, so we can see uh, the voices and the workers being crunched further in Republic of Srpska. And how is this connected to the SLAC suit? Well, uh, as I said before, the criminalization of the Republic of Srpska, uh, if someone tells some politician or investor usually, or any other person that uh, is a person they must be smeared, slander, or something like that, uh, they could, you know, uh, file a lot to But now, uh, especially because media is on the rise, as I said, independent media, and uh, as, uh, as uh, politics say that we should have more independent media, but also we can have more slaps. Because most of the slaps in our country is connected to the independent media and to the activists. So you can see that we are connection. Why? Because that independent media, especially established ones and active established ones, are trying to critically. Uh, argue and connect corruption and some uh, happenings in the country for the media that can be any topic for you know business section, common political section, they can connect all oh, this is happening with this politician like that. So if you criticize like that, then it will monitor it and they use their political power to turn it in. But the activist is similar, especially environmental. It's an environmental act and said, okay, we will leave according to evidence or their own eyes often. This firm is doing this, this against my own given. Uh, I wish to defend myself on falling out with this firm. And as a reaction, you get the slash for who are you to smear the whole name of this firm? Like, especially. This firm is going to benefit your country. Remember that MDF player 
claro, está muito está em busca de entender fazer as sobre o que ele faz, passar por ele e tentar pensar o que ele está fazendo. Because information is defined as uh, um, spreading the actual information which you know is false with the intention to hurt somebody and that is objectively harmful. So we thought it's not possible that the journalist could be sentenced for defamation because there is no journalist who knowingly and in purpose spread the false information. Unfortunately, it happens that some of them uh, were sentenced despite uh, uh, the intention and the awareness of the anti-control information was not proved by the government. The second very important uh, um, is insults. So, what is not information as defined, as I can describe, is insult. So, spreading true information with hurts on its reputation, spreading uh, value judgments which are harmful, et cetera, et cetera. But there is one article which states there is no uh, criminal offense of insults if that insult is information. Uh, was spread in uh, doing a journalistic job and in public interest. We thought that these two elements are pretty enough that no journalist in Croatia will be sentenced. Unfortunately, some of them are uh, sentenced. The rate is judgment, which is uh, still not public judgment, but it's very, very uh, important. State for this. The judge said, okay, the law says that uh, if you are insulting, you insult somebody in a, 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 a journalistic job and in public interest, there is no criminal offense. But what you did, it's not a journalistic job because the journalistic job is not to spread uh, offensive value judgments. And the judge said that that means the argument. That that element of journalistic work is not a journalistic work. Uh, it is against the journalistic ethics, it's improper, etc., etc., and we have to protect somebody's reputation. And that somebody was vulnerating from our rights, political link, uh, and she's not a lot of journalism in India, for example, in the world, and social democratic political. 
So I think it's really disaster. Uh, and nobody expected that the world would be implemented in such a way. I really do hope that the European Union is successful and it is something that I can tell not this tribe that the judgment will be a and a trial and a and but it's it's not really a hope that the judge is decided that the journalistic job is not the journalistic job because they have to fly. So, so in, in this such implementation of even good criminal law is uh, uh, a very big problem in, in my country. And that's why I repeat the again that education of judges is one of the most important issues. When speaking about criminal information, that's the two examples which was rather involved for the Boston Index law. We didn't have at least one argument from the European point of view for the criminalization. We have the recommendation of Council of Europe, but nothing else. We do not have any judgment of the European Court of Human Rights, which would state that a criminal reaction uh, on, on some uh, untrue and harmful information is not acceptable in the democratic society because the other intervention uh, expressly said get a sentence for the information on both because it's not acceptable the contribution of the democratic society, but never states that a criminal sentence and such is something that is unacceptable. This is one of the reasons uh, why we either believe that some selfish wanted to tell with some arguments against that law. We actually didn't see them. We didn't get uh, the support of the uh, ambassadors of the European countries. Actually, only Americans really advocate for freedom of expression and against uh, that war. That is uh, something which is a big problem. And that's why sometimes on the European level, some things happen which are not useful. I can mention only one example, which is pretty different. It is access to information. So information is quite right normal if you ask the government about the salaries, about the daily allowances, and all the other um, information which are quite efficient. And one of our uh, journalists after that from the European Commission. What do you mean? Because it was classified information. And after that, you, you really cannot expect to get the support from the European institution would be very strong. And, and let's say somehow I don't use the word honest because I think that it might be very smart, but maybe uh, also uh, the, the example of the Dunan Nato, which is something which really frightens. If she was not elected to gain the game, uh, because she was really very good at all the thinking about uh, Dunan's work in the city, and the same was the deal that she did a great job. So that is something that is one of this. So is, just to say something about civil cases, we have uh, several cases where each we are considered in strike. Some uh, they, so we have more than thousand cases. Uh, some uh, people think that about thirty cases are flat. Some think that about seven to twelve, and it depends on the data. But we are trying to make the public aware that not every lawsuit of on every public person or a, or wealthy company is a slap. We should be uh, very careful in using such technology because we would trivialize the whole concept of slaps. So we think that we have some slaps and the basic problem with these slaps, I would say, is also in the function. Because we have one judge who sues dozens of publishers for uh, for dozens and dozens of articles uh, about the same event, and judges do not want to make decision about all these cases as a whole. 
they they do not want to look at the captain in the exposure and say, I have this article and I am making decision on the article. So the context could very big problem. Just to mention that this topic and um, what that means for the uh, country, for our country. Um, just a uh, last question for me, and then I would like to prepare um, the questions from the audience. So, you, uh, you mentioned the, um, the support uh, that you were stating when you were discussing uh, the reform of the information um, that's it. The European Commission did react. It's not there is uh, an initiative that was developed last year, which comprises a directive, a draft directive to now the European workers. Um, the directive is now being discussed. Um, it's been on the table in the European institutions. Uh, but there are some challenges when it comes to what potentially what will come out of the discussion and the kind of thing. So I want to share for you because you are as a member of the expert group and last to the European Commission you have worked with a lawyer and have worked with uh, uh, international law and international law. So I would like to get to know what the problems are, what the good parts are of the directive, and in your opinion, if you can to see that coming out that would actually have safeguards um, against labs in the United States and also the United Okay, uh, I was not uh, very active member of that group, and that's why I think I would be very reluctant to speak about the work of the expert group. There is also something uh, about the, the, the whole work on the draft in the US. I would say that the, the, the basic problem is something that happens in other countries as well. When you have groups, people who are really trying to create something, but from two points of view. One is activist point of view, and one is legal point of view. So, we lawyers are very uh, obstructive. We think that some things are not possible to create. So we are aware that access to the court is part of uh, voting rights, or as I was talking to Zara today. So, we cannot say that the politician does not have rights to file a speech. You cannot say that uh, wealthy companies do not have business reputation and do not have foreign laws. So, something like that is not possible. Uh, it's not enough just to describe the plenty. Uh, and the symptoms to uh, to uh, justify the, the pronounced lawsuit as a threat. So these are legal thoughts. We know that uh, um, abusive litigation exists in other areas. In business, for example, I in my country, there are some companies which use state uh, pressure. Or in, uh, the, in the international arbitrage, asking for and dozens of millions of years, it doesn't matter, because uh, the goal is to keep up the rest. We get to finish in Croatia and it starts to build something. So we cannot create in the proceedings laws something which is the specific for journalists or media or the NGR activism or something like that. And you should have uh, a, a proceeding which is uh, which which can be implemented in all case when it is a problem. That's why I, I was very skeptical that the laws advocating about the access. Uh, could be implemented in the directive, and the directive will really have some uh, obligatory effects in the conscious. My opinion was, you know, there is one gap uh, on the uh, uh, in the EU framework uh, which relates to non obligation uh, damage. It is not covered by the wrong regulation to any piece of work. And my opinion, when, when we speak about those voting issues, and my opinion was that the directive will, at the end, will be implemented just as uh, our colleagues said, just on the post voting issues 
and if everything else will be just a recommendation. Mm -hmm. And maybe else, it is also very important to consider the important that to have the definition itself, to have uh, the declaration or recommendation, or even if the director of it will not be obligatory uh, in the strict sense uh, from the Brussels. That something bad is going on against me again, journalists in the future. And then we can use that in our countries. We can argue that I'm going to reconsider the best for our judges and for our public. That's why I think that we should be from the Brussels to the Brussels that the, the, the results will not be unfortunately, but unfortunately, I'm not sure what our journalists and media expected because after the first draft of the directive, everything else uh, actually produced a disappointment of our journalists. And uh, what I think that we are doing that we should advocate in our countries, but for the idea, you would have mentioned the international law because it was a very important one. I would stress that uh, that was also very important in British, especially in the nineties. Uh, in our, I know something about Serbia and Bosnia Herzegovina laws because some laws were laws that laws there still are very safe. But uh, we in our proceeding laws do not have the institute of the security You know, which is something very relevant and very often used in the people they want to do security ones. Uh, uh, some people that have seen in our countries and had some very good things for the other issues, then maybe pick up some of the judges to be kind of very good. Thank you so much. Really, so much thing with that. Um, we don't have a lot of time left, but maybe there are a couple of questions for the audience to come to continue. Um, and we have to do an opportunity. Uh, not, uh, I mean, I'm sure that we have a more opportunity to talk. Uh, I would like to thank uh, our speakers once again for um, present the cases, the situation in the country, the results in the initiatives, and obviously the organizing system of the and of the government for organizing the event. And uh, if we can talk about it, I can continue with that.